everyone. I'm Jasmine Hayes, Executive Director of the Capacity Building Center for States. And on behalf of the center and our planning partners, welcome to the 2021 Child Welfare Virtual Expo, Advancing Racial Equity in Child Welfare. Today is an opportunity to connect and exchange ideas with peers and colleagues and to network with other participants through our virtual networking spaces, as well as the exhibit hall and resource gallery, where you'll find downloadable resources and tools that can help you navigate today's sessions and support your work going forward. Our first session sets the stage for what we hope is a day that generates reflection, raises questions, elicits ideas, and uses data and evidence to directly tackle the structures, policies, and biases that are part of systems that were never designed to be equitable. We have to name structural racism before we can move forward. For some of you, today may be one of the first opportunities you've had to engage in discussions and hear from peers and experts about racial equity and child welfare, the impact of racism and bias that continues to disproportionately impact Black, American Indian, Alaska Native, and other children, youth, and families of color. For others, this may be a point along a long journey where you can share and reflect as you hear from many different voices, all moving towards a shared vision of equity. Regardless of where you are in your experience, we're all on this path together. So let's get to the first session. I have the pleasure of introducing someone I've had the good fortune to work with over the past year in ways that demonstrate what an agent of change looks like. Louis Gasper has deep expertise as a foster youth advocate and consultant, working over the past 10 years with multiple foster care organizations that have shifted their curriculum, programming and strategic plans to prioritize race equity. At the Capacity Building Center for States, Louis is leading a jurisdictional subcommittee on shared language, where he's co-creating the strategic vision and plan for shared understanding in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Louis also serves on the Race Equity Committee to inform ongoing efforts in strategic planning and has conducted committee research on anti-racist frameworks. He has the ability to bring people together in a way that challenges, encourages, and guides thoughtful reflection and willingness to take action. Please welcome our moderator for this session, Louis Gasper. Thank you for the warm welcome and thoughtful words. My name is Louis Gasper, and I'm a young adult consultant with the Capacity Building Center for States. More importantly, less than two years ago today, I was part of the over 400,000 children and youth that have been represented in the foster care system at that time. Today, we have the opportunity to create a discussion which covers aspects of racial equity that we didn't get to talk about while I was in the system because of the difficulty and controversy of these conversations. Just a quick disclaimer that there may be parts of this session where there may be differences in terms or concept usage even though we do not have time to specifically go over all of those terms, we encourage you to seek out information to whatever you may not know in order to build the foundations for shared language and understanding necessary to move this work forward. I'm elated to be discussing how we, will, how we truly approach racial equity within the child welfare system with some of the experts who are teaching, leading, and guiding our next generation of leaders for the future. Today, we'll be digging into the impact of the history of the development of child welfare systems. We will share data that illustrates the current context of structural racism and disparity in child welfare and related systems. And we will be discussing opportunities and actions to begin to reduce racial and historical inequities in their jurisdictions through a restorative approach to sharing power with children, youth, and families. Joining me now for insights and analysis are Sandy Whitehawk, founder of the First Nations Repatriation Institute, Rako Boyd, assistant professor at the University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work, Robert Matthews, a acting director for the Washington DC Child and Family Services Agency, and Shade Daniels, managing training director for California Youth Connection. But first, we will be kicking off this morning with the blessing from Sandy Whitehawk. As a member of the Lakota tribe, Sandy has been an advocate for tribal communities and child welfare for decades as a consultant, leader, and somebody who approaches this work with an open heart. 
She is the founder and director of the First Nations Repatriation Institute. Sandy also or organizes the Truth Healing Reconciliation Community Forums that bring together adoptees and fostered individuals and their families with professionals. At the Capacity Building Center for States, we recognize that there are so many tribes with varying cultural practices and preferences, and this blessing is not comprehensive to any groups of Native Americans or tribes. This means we must strive to uplift many voices from tribal communities all over today, tomorrow, and every day after that. With that said, I feel so grateful because I know what you've prepared for us, Sandy, isn't just something that you've prepared for today, but something that speaks from your heart on your values and identity. Please welcome Sandy Whitehawk. Sandy, I know we're so excited to hear from you today and take it away. Thank you, Louie. Greetings, relatives. It is a good day. I said a few words of introduction as how we are instructed to greet the people. It's an important piece of our identity and understanding of who we are as a Sichangu Lakota, which means I'm from the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. And I said, I greet you with a good heart. The language is powerful and strong and centers us in our identity. And it wasn't until I was 47 years old before I learned to address people in this manner. And it took even a year after that to understand why saying, I greet you with a good heart. It means my intentions are good at this moment. It means that I am open and that I'm willing to share from my heart. Everything about our language, it teaches us, centers us, grounds us, gives us a sense of belonging. It's so very important that all our Indian children understand this and know this from their respective tribes. That's why it's so vital to do this Thank you for asking me to do this and offering this time. And I said, Matakiapi, which is relatives, greetings, relatives. <clears throat> as human beings and part of this creation, we are indeed relatives you know, as each other and to each other as human beings. We're also relatives to all living things within our earth that sustains us. When we begin to understand this, at our core, it helps us understand and have compassion for each other. <clears throat> we'll be sharing, I will be sharing more of those concepts later um, as we uh, go into the day. The blessing that I will offer today for us is going to be a very simple one. It's a very simple song. I'll explain when I'm done. <clears throat> One can tanka toka heya chewa kielo e. One can tanka toka heya chewa kielo e. Mita kuyeo wanik tacha. Toka heya chewa kielo hey. That song is a very simple song, but yet a very powerful prayer. We sing this song in all our ceremonies, Sundance ceremonies uh, in the sweat lodge. We sing it, I sing it in the morning often to begin my day. It's simply translated, I want to live with my relatives. So I will pray first. It's just a moment of meditation to center ourselves, to know that there is a plan and a purpose for our day. And there is a plan and a purpose in our life. So today, as we're gathered here in the cyberspace, we can connect spiritually, even though we're disconnected physically, by making a decision to open that part of us that makes us human and makes us relatives to each other. 
So our prayer today, relatives, is that you will discover exactly why you're here and listening to this training, because it is no accident that you're tuned in and taking part in this uh, discussions that we will be having today. And I know that it is for a good purpose for yourself as a practitioner and your work as you share with your colleagues. Most importantly, that you will be learning something from to use within your gift to uh, offer our families and communities that need your support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy, for that amazing and thoughtful blessing. I think it's so important when we have these conversations to also understand the practices and rituals and uh, all of the things that really make up the foundation of it. Um, and, you know, I was looking through your through your bio and I saw you had a lot of great awards, but one that really stuck out to me was that you were one of the top 50 cool and influential people <laughs> of, a, was it Madison, Wisconsin? Yeah. Yeah, and I truly believe it. Um, <laughs> I think you're one of the coolest people that we've gotten to see. And I think, you know, even just being able to show uh, this this blessing to as many people as will get to see it is, is such, a, such a great honor for all of us. Uh, I want to kind of dive into the first part of the, the show with really talking about the historical foundations uh, of the history of child welfare. So uh, just really want to hear from, from your uh, knowledge and also experiences and what you've been able to learn. What are uh, those exact foundations of the, the history of child welfare and given, given the context of U.S. history and also uh, the child welfare system that we're in today? The history of child welfare is, when, when I think about it, um, I, I'm going to say this all in, in layman's terms because I'm not a trained social worker. I'm not a trained um, a psychologist or anything like that. However, I have a really good understanding about the um, system that was put in place. And so we have one of the things that we have to remember is that each era or each um, uh, the development came about as a result of what was happening at the time. So initially, um, children were in orphanages because of poverty. And it wasn't just Native children. The, the, the history was really built around white white society and the needs of the time. So um, individuals, families, you know, placed children in orphanages, families um, or the orphanages started uh, <clears throat> ma matching, wanting to find places for these children to live and uh, children were adopted. However, what happened is somebody along the line said there could be some money made here because families that could not have children for various reasons were in need. And it became, instead of finding places for these children who actually had a need, it became a need for families that wanted children, which flipped that script. And then we became a commodity as adoptees. And when I say we, I'm not focusing on Native children right now, but all children prior, prior to the focus that they made on Indian children, because we did become a target at some point, or a targeted population for removal and adoption. <clears throat> so anyway, this, this flipped the script in terms of realizing that there was a uh, demand and a need for uh, babies or young children to fulfill the need for uh, families who did not have children. So people were really making this up as they went along, which is really what we do, right? There's a problem at hand, and then we figure out what we're going to do. What we forget is that we can change things when we see that the decisions that were made were not made necessarily with the best interest because when we once we see the outcome of these placements of these kinds of decisions, then there's a problem within child welfare. We have to be willing to admit, wow, okay, so money changes everything. Money changes how people think about things because once money's involved, then the, the focus really goes off of the children. 
Now, I know I'm, there's people squirming right now saying, that is not what I think. I always want to make sure that children are, are um, their needs are being met. Well, then I'm not talking to you. But we have a system in place that is not beneficial to the outcomes of children in as a whole. So anyway, then in the 40s, 50s, um, Indian children began to be targeted for removal. And there was a huge campaign, uh, initially called the Indian Adoption Project. The Indian Adoption Project was um, had adopted out 395 children. After that adoption process took place, they had a study. David Fanshell did a study called Far From the Reservation. However, he never spoke to an adoptee. He only talked to adoptive parents of prepubescent children, and everything was fine. Children were faring well. So they used that as a go-ahead and taught Lutheran social services, Catholic social services, and other private agencies how to um, campaign and reach Indian children. It got so horrendous that Indian women in urban areas who were who gave birth, often <clears throat> who were single, not and um, maybe not employed as well, or not employed in a way that would feel like they could support a child many times were coerced to have to adopt their child out. They were told you don't have the money, you, you don't have the resources, you have to offer your child this opportunity. Some of the mothers that I've heard uh, give their story um, went to sleep and woke up the next day wanting to see their baby and were told their baby had died. And they were adopted out because that was a way to ensure no arguments, no, we're, you know, um, no, no barriers, you know, she's gone. So never being able to hold them. So there was a lot of shame around that era in the 60s, especially or late 50s, around women who had sex and then got pregnant. Um, that affected every, every race, a lot of shame. So uh, what we learn from that then is that at least 25 to 35% of Indian children were removed from their homes. It was so uh, such a attitude toward Indian families that on the Potawatomi Reservation in Michigan, um, this was in the 50s, uh, as it was told to me, the uh, families supported themselves by harvesting pulpwood and would go into the woods, do their work, leaving the older children with the younger children. Social services, knowing about this, went in and onto the reservation and went home to home, and whoever didn't have an adult in it removed those children. And all of those children were um, adopted out. The parents were um, charged with child neglect. So it was very, um, for Native people anyway, we became a target. And it's been undoing this target thought uh, has been going on ever since. We've been trying to undo this through the uh, passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act uh, in 1978. It seems like even though the federal act has been there, what we have done since then is trying to uphold, make people uphold the law. Sandy, thank you for that wealth of knowledge uh, as we talk about the historical foundations of child welfare. I'm gonna welcome in our panel of experts to continue on this conversation uh, so we can really start to understand what these historical foundations look like throughout the US. All right, we are so excited to welcome in Shade Daniels, Rako Boyd and Robert Matthews into this conversation. So really just want to be able to ask you all to, to add on to this. Uh, what what else is critical to understand when we think about the foundations, the historical foundations of child welfare uh, when it relates to race equity? When we think about the historical context of when it is 
th I do, one of the things I do is work with young people that are currently in foster care. And we recently had a conference where we specifically created a workshop on the racialized history of foster care. So we created a timeline as an activity within that workshop where we compared the social eras in movements uh, in particular, those that were uh, predicated on identity uh, to the development of child welfare. And we pushed our uh, CYC California Youth Connection members who are all current and former system involved youth, whether it's foster care or juvenile justice. We uh, challenged them to make connections between those social eras from the past and now uh, to how child welfare, this system developed. And I think that was really critical, especially for young people, especially for everybody, but for young people, because they were able to see and contextualize how their experiences in foster care connects with a long history of oppressive systems. Um, so we did, we had um, members from all backgrounds who were able to interrogate, you know, the timing of the first uh, all off reservation and boarding school, and then also being able to juxtapose what that looks like now in the fact that you know our native, our indigenous children are the most disproportionate within foster care. But what does that mean? And the, the thing about it that was really powerful for me is that it showcased how change is so critical in acknowledging the past. Because if we don't do that, then we look at the current, the future, uh, the current present state that we're in as if this was just created by design. And if that's how we operate, then even our member, our youth, our young people who are in the system, they're not able to advocate in that effective and equitable way because they don't even understand how contextually it's not the system that exists now. This has been the system that has existed since creation. Um, so I really appreciated hearing um, everything that Sandy stated because, again, the, the understanding that 25 to 35 percent, like that's a quarter of our of the indigenous population at that time were in the children in foster care that in itself is crazy but then when we go back to where we are now we see how that disproportionality it still continues so we have a history of targeting and we have a history of using systems that are supposed to encourage wellness that and well-being or welfare that don't always do that. Um, so I really appreciated what Sandy had to say, but also understanding that in order for us to truly advocate for our systems change and equity, we can't ignore the fact that our current system is uh, by design um, and has been in creation for centuries. Shade is exactly correct. She is right. Uh, we also, so we need to know that organized child protection was created for the protection of white children. It was not designed as a system to promote the safety of children who are not white. And as, as she so clearly pointed out, um, to understand this and to better understand it, we can go back to what we typically learn as the origins of organized child protection in this country. So as a foundation, we're often taught about the case of Mary Ellen in 1874. Yeah. A nine-year-old white child who had suffered severe abuse and neglect at the hands of her guardians uh, and whose dire circumstances really highlighted gaps in legal mechanisms of that day for state intervention, right? We are told that Mary Ellen's case uh, really was the, the motivation for the children's rights movement, but that movement was also, uh, we can understand it was also based on white Eurocentric Protestant values of morality. We also typically learn about Charles Loring Brace, right, and how he established a children, Children's Aid Society in 1853, that it was meant to care for abandoned orphans um, in the streets who are living in the streets of New York. But what we sometimes leave out is this was his intervention was created for white children and that he believed that those children could help settle the uh, expanding American West through placements with families. Um, we know that this led to the orphan train movement, but the orphan train movement was a system for white children and families that, re that resettled more than 200,000 white children throughout the early 1900s. What we do less of and what we don't focus on uh, as much when we learn about the history of organized child protection is the bigger lesson that we should and could take from juxtaposing the circumstances 
and the societal treatments of children of color in this country during the same exact time period that organized child protection emerged. So just as an example, during this same time period, Black children were still being sought, bought, sold and bought um, as commodities. They were still being separated from their families for profit um, through the dehumanizing system of slavery. Following the end of slavery, they were there were new strategies for separating Black children from their families. So that occurred through convict leasing and through Black codes. So these were these were specific policies, regulations that were put in place that meant that Black children could be bound to provide labor without their parents' consent from as young as six years old until they reached the age of majority, which was about 16 at that time. So this, this history is well documented and overall it makes, it really makes clear that um, you know, the centrality of white children and the exclusion of, or marginalization of children of color is the foundation of the current system we have. Rayco and others, uh, I, I think you are spot on. And when I think about the historical origins, it all goes back to really looking at the data today that we have an overrepresentation of children of color who make up the overwhelming number of kids in foster care. And as you also eloquently walked through the historical aspects of it, what you've shown is that it's a system that wasn't built to ensure the well-being and welfare for children of color. As you talked about, Ray Coe, about during, during the time of slavery and separating families, think about how the system does today. They surveil families and they separate families. So really when I think about what's needed to help shift or reimagine or reform the system today is that we need to build the system based on the system that um, is gonna be the individual or families that are gonna be impacted by it. So I think, I oftentimes think that, you know, maybe the intent in the beginning was, you know, a great positive intent. Maybe they wanted to do good, but through the evolution of our national history, we have seen where there's been a strategic focus on families of color for whatever reason. And with that, we need actually families of color to step up and speak out to say, hey, we're tired of being surveilled. We're tired of having someone show up to our home, not really because of abuse and neglect, but because I may not have the necessary resources to provide you know, adequate care to my kids. So that's not a child welfare issue. That's an issue around how can we level the playing field? How can we make it equitable that I can ensure that I have the same support of a, a white family um, than the support that I have? And it may be that I may not have the educational attributes that they may have, right? But that doesn't mean that I nonetheless don't have the internal strengths to support and raise my kids. I just need support. I don't need anyone to hand me something, but I need someone to lift their hand to help me lift my own family up. So. When I think about what's needed now, we need individuals to speak up, speak out, and to help develop the system of support that's that's needed today for families of color. I was thinking, um, uh, one of the things I always point out as far as a system that is not even uh, designed to really truly help uh, white families even, because it, I don't think it was till 1938 that the child labor law was passed. I mean, we still had children in factories, right? So this whole idea of intervention has not been an intervention of healing. What can we do? And the money that is given to foster parents could be reallocated to the parents that are, that are struggling. And, and there's all kinds of things. But in, And when you say that, you either get complete silence or blink, blink, we got to figure out what, you know, it's, I don't understand why that is such a huge barrier. It's simple. We should be able to call from our respective agencies that are servicing families and say, we have a family that needs a new refrigerator to pass this home inspection. And, you know, there, we all know refrigerators get thrown away. There's somebody somewhere where you should be able to call and get a refrigerator. This is not difficult, but it is not the chosen method because we're not focused on that. Our focus is not our words that we use and the focus is not toward healing or family preservation. Well, just think about it, Sandy. I know we don't have much uh, time left in this segment, but 
as you just mentioned, how this system is designed, we give money to a total stranger when we separate a child from their parent. Yeah. We give them money from the room and the board to care for this kid. So just think about if we reallocate those funds, as you just mentioned, to really have a focused um, intervention on keeping families together. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be a much better use of keeping families together, I guarantee you'll begin to see all of the outcomes we talk about. The kids can stay connected to their parents, their peers, their schools, their places of worship. And we know socially and development, developmentally, they will do better. So it is how the system is designed. And, and you're right, when you think about, just think about today, um, as we look through the pandemic, um, we are now providing child tax credits to families through December, um, which is something that I know, Rayco, we talked about in planning, that it's something simple we can do. And it's not just throwing money at families, but we already know we have so many families who live way below the poverty guidelines. And that's oftentimes the reasons why we remove them. And it's not because of abuse and neglect, it's because of lack exactly. of resources, so. It's, yeah. And just even the fact that the phrase throwing money at them, is out there shows the judgment and the disdain that we have. It's not just, that's a very, I'm not saying you hold that viewpoint, Robert, you're, you know, that's the phrase that's just out there, throwing money at them as if, it, so even our language, our language has to change, which will change how we uh, are motivated and will change how we get creative, you know, if you, you change the language, so. You're right. Um, everyone, it's it's the the thing that I learned in doing our truth healing reconciliation forums was having those who've been through the system explain and share what happened to them after these decisions were made to professionals who are making these decisions see that the outcome isn't what they wanted. We could have this conversation for many days. We, I want to have a whole expo with just y'all four. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I think, you know, we bring up some really good points about family preservation and even efforts, you know, when we think about prevention all the way to the current context uh, and really trying to think about how we envision that for our children and families of color, uh, which is something that I hope that we can continue to have uh, as conversations throughout our, our panels. So thank you so much for all the amazing <clears throat> feedback and contributions. Uh, and we're so grateful to have you all. All right, Reiko, thank you so much for joining us and being part of this conversation. As we continue to give context as far as what disproportionality and disparity look like, uh, I'm just really curious on a high level, uh, why must we prioritize racial and ethnic equity and why right now? Well, simply put, lives depend on this. The question is, how can we not? Um, so racial inequities are currently and have always been a defining feature of child welfare systems. And when we look at, look at the data, we can understand that for decades, the same story is being told over and over again. Um, and for example, to summarize the information you covered and the data you covered, we, we already know that, that Black and Native American families are overrepresented among referrals to the system, among investigative reports. They're more likely than families of other backgrounds to experience a substantiated maltreatment report, more likely to experience the forced removal of children from their homes, and also more likely to experience the termination of parental rights. So these alarms regarding racial inequities have been sounded long ago, um, but, but unfortunately, little has changed over the past 50 years. And we're learning more now, um, Recent studies shed new light on really the expansive reach of the system surveillance on Black and Native American families. Um, so we should understand that studies that examine the likelihood of contact with CPS during childhood have some clear and consistent findings. So they're showing that by their 18th birthday, nearly half of Black and Native American children in this country are the subjects of investigated child maltreatment reports. 
Um, and so that's a, that's a staggering figure. And it really kind of demonstrates that the truth is we've never really made the pursuit of racial equity a priority, um, but that needs to change now. And the pursuit of equity, of racial justice, of freedom from systematic destruction of oppressive conditions, it, that has actually always been a, an imperative, a priority for communities of color. Um, if we look really and pay attention, we will see robust legacies of, of self-help, of activism, of resistance, and of organizing. And the question that, that we should ask is, how do we become part of that legacy? Um, how do we join? And so, you know, we really have to start with a willingness to reverse course, to adopt a fundamentally different approach that will actually interrupt the cycle of inequity. And you, in my view, prioritizing and prioritizing now actually starts with reckon, recognizing that just simply documenting disparities and documenting racial differences without digging in and exposing root causes uh, really can perpetuate uh, the disparities that we see and that we say we want to get rid of. Thank you. And, and I think that's really interesting what you bring up about the root causes. Uh, and, and I'm curious how you think that we should think about root causes when it comes to the current state of disproportionality and disparity in, fo in foster care, but also in, in other adjacent systems. Right. Well, we, in order to get to the root causes, we must focus squarely on structural racism. So structural racism is a fundamental root cause of racial disproportionality and disparities in the system and in adjacent systems. And so if we're going to focus on it, we have to understand what it is, right? So there, there are a lot of definitions of structural racism out, but I find the definition and explanation that is articulated by a scholar, Trisha Rose, as being especially enlightening. And so uh, Rose defines structural racism as the normalization and legitimization of an array of dynamics, uh, historical, cultural, institutional, and interpersonal that routinely advantage white people while producing cumulative and chronic adverse outcomes for people of color. So I know that's a lot to digest, right? But focusing on some of the keywords can help us understand uh, a, bit, a bit more. So when we say normalization, that means that structural racism is it's built into everyday practice. It's not exceptional. It's not one-off behavior or individual bad attitudes. It's, it's not the occasionally intentionally negative policy. It's actually a process that happens in a normal everyday way. It's, it's as normal as the air we breathe. And it's often invisible to, to many of us, not all of us, but to, to many. Um, when we, we think about legitimization, that means that we legitimize institutions that are clearly functioning in structurally waste, racist ways, which means that they're clearly producing dramatic, cumulative, and chronic adverse outcomes, yet they're nonetheless legitimate and they're not to the side or they're not marginal. And so um, we also, this definition also helps us understand that structural racism is not just about the past, it's not just about this, this old legacy that's that's waning over time, that's just decreasing its relevance in the present. It, rather, it's it has present formulations and it's both historical and present tense at the same time. Um, it also involve, involves cultural elements. So it involves the ways we talk about race. Uh, so it's, it's not just policy, but it is also policy. It's present in institutions, uh, we see it in governmental policy and corporations and educational institutions. Um, and it also is inter interpersonal. So it involves the ways that we interact with and create relationships with other people. So overall, we can see if the consequences and the material conditions that are experiences, experienced by uh, affected groups. So differential access to quality education, housing, home ownership, decent jobs, livable wages, access to health care, appropriate medical facilities, clean, safe environments. So it shows up also in access to power. So access to information, including, you know, one's own history, access to resources, so wealth and organizational infrastructure, to voice, including voting rights, 
representation in government, mass media. And so I, I'll, I'll stop here and just say that because of structural racism, there is an association between socioeconomic status and race in this country. We have to understand that structural racism, it, it shapes social and structural determinants that are crit critical anchors of well-being. Thank you, Reiko. And I know you're probably a few weeks into the school year already, but I'm still wondering if it's too late to sign up for your lectures because I really wanna join. <laughs> Seriously, we cannot thank you enough for joining us. Next up, we have a man who is trying to create structural change from the top down. Robert Matthews is currently the acting director of the Child Family and Services Agency for the District of Columbia. Prior to this appointment, Robert served as the principal deputy director of CFSA. During this time, Robert was also appointed to manage CFSA's performance towards exiting the district's 32-year LaShawn consent degree. In the past, Robert has also served as the deputy of entry services, the deputy director of community partnership, and has been a senior associate with the Annie Casey Foundation. And thank you so much uh, for joining us. I'll just uh, dive right in. Uh, so I'm curious, what does your agency's current work to reduce disparity, uh, advance equity, and support families look like? And uh, what are some of the key lessons that you would share with others who are leading this work? So Louis, I think it's a great question. And I just wanna say that with here in Washington, DC, we're really at the beginning stages of really having this discussion around race and equity. But I'm excited that we are doing this in coordination with the Center for States, who has been a wonderful partner with us in having this discussion. So one of the things I thought about as I made the decision that DC should take on um, this role in terms of talking about race and equity is that we need to have a good understanding of the language and understanding of how to use terms such as race, equity, disproportionality, and disparity, because as I've heard it being used, it's been used interchangeably. And so it's important that we equip and tool our staff, as well as our system, to know what these terms mean in the context of the work that we do. So let's talk a little bit about what we do in DC. So we have separated this work into four different subcommittees. And the first subcommittee is, is much of what I just spoke about, having a shared language and understanding, which to me is the foundation of where at least we start having this discussion. And what that means is there are certain terms that have come to mind as we've talked about this recently, such as at-risk families. At-risk families, normally people think when you say that, you're talking about families of color. And with that comes this whole perception as if, um, these families of color don't have the basic needs that they have to, in order to be nurturing parents to their kids, right? Which then subjects them to being a part of the child welfare system. But just think about the perception of that. And what other term could you use that brings respect to that family? Um, and that's a term that's more appropriate in terms of how you define those families. So those are the types of discussions we're having in that particular subcommittee. We're also looking at our other committees, such as data. What does our data look like in terms of the rate of removals that we are having here in the District of Columbia, understanding that based on the 2019 census, demographically, we have about 45% um, uh, within our city made up of people of color, and 42% uh, people of color, uh, not people of color, but uh, of, of white people. But in our child welfare system, we are removing kids of color at a higher rate, a disproportionate rate. And so what that allows us to do is to look within our own agency, to look at the decisions we're making on the front end, to look at our practice, and to look at the additional training that's needed. So we have a training subcommittee, we have a data subcommittee, and we have a policy subcommittee. And I think when you look overall at all four, it's going to really help propel and move our agency forward as we have this discussion. In terms of things that I would suggest for other peers of mine who are leading child welfare agencies, I start with, guess what? Just have the discussion, have the courage, have the motivation to have the discussion, no matter the demographic makeup of your particular county or system, no matter what the political landscape is, 
do understand that unless you decide to take up and discuss race and equity, you're gonna to continue to see much of the same. And much of the same is that nationally, we are disproportionately removing kids of color at a high rate. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit to those jurisdictions that may be under a federal consent decree, which basically means that uh, they are being sued by plaintiff attorneys and have a court monitor monitoring uh, the child welfare reforms that are gonna be needed for to ensure that these agencies um, have better outcomes for children and families. What I found is that initially, usually when there's a consent decree, it definitely has a purpose. And the purpose is to ensure that that particular agency and system has the resources it needs to provide the supports needed to serve families. But what I saw missing is having these benchmarks and exit standards uh, be looked at through a race and equity lens. Because oftentimes the benchmarks and the exit standards um, set a child welfare agency on a course to just concentrate on very small goals, placements, permanency, child protective services. And it's really from a quantitative perspective. But when you've been seeing the data in terms of the rates of removals, who's being removed and why, all of that is interrelated to race and equity. So my suggestion and, and, and my suggestion to my peers is, if you begin to take on race and equity, looking at all of your policy and practice through the race and equity lens, what you will see is if you concentrate resources there, you'll begin to see over time how the outcomes for children and families will change because what you've been basically doing is targeting families of color disproportionately based on the practices you have in place. But then when you can see that you make those changes, looking at race and equity and inclusion and how some of those policies in place have probably been um, inappropriately um, oppressing a particular population for so long to whereby a mother or father may not have the basic needs becoming a hotline call versus what other kind of community support or response can be put in place, you'll begin to see that it could narrow the calls to the child welfare agency and then allowing you to pivot to how you can create a prevention model for these families versus them getting deeper, deeper involved in a, in a public system. So I hope that when you think about all that I've said, one, start with the conversation. Two, think about looking at your data and your practice through race and equity. And if you just so happen to be under consent decree, begin to think about how you can incorporate this work into some of your exit standards. And I'll be, you'll begin to see those outcomes change over time. Thank you so much for really adding to this amazing conversation uh, throughout. And I just really wanna ask y'all just a simple question. How are the child welfare system systems failing youth of color, Native American youth, Black youth, other um, Hispanic youth, um, and, and other, other youth of color? And, and what are some of the ways that we can uh, really up, approach these uh, issues of dis disparity and disproportionality through a solution-based lens? Well, I would like to go back to the language that we use when working with families. I remember being a, a qualified expert witness in a case and the, there were uh, three, four children involved. The oldest one was a very young teenager, like 13-ish. And they said that he was a runaway, that he kept running away. Kept, and when I read the records, I was kind of surprised that they were using that terminology because he was going home. And that's not running away. And it's probably a trauma response because removing your child from the parent, removing children from their parents is, creates a trauma. Children don't go, oh good, I'm not by my mom anymore when she drank. They don't do that. And so the, it does affect their, their thinking capacity. They just wanna be back home. So how do we change that language? 
when we look at things in a healing way, that's how we would look at, we wouldn't look at that as in a punitive way. A lot of the language I think is almost, um, I think it'll, there was a time when they were even using AWOL, which is a military term, you know, or other terminology. So we, if we're going to be healing oriented, then we have to use healing language, encouraging language. We have to encourage um, social workers to not tell their clients, um, you're never getting your child back. They don't know that. And for them to say that is, is shaming to the individual. There's so many things within there. And I know that there's a, a larger system thing that can happen, but I, I'm talking about what I see on the ground, what I hear from individuals and what, you know, and what I witness. At the Indian Child Welfare Law Center, we have parent mentors. These parent mentors, uh, when the lawyers are working with them on the legal side, the parent mentors are individuals who have had case plans, who've had children removed, who've uh, worked to get them back. They have had maybe even have a, um, a prison history. They can speak more experientially to anything encouraging to an individual than anything anyone else can say to them and talk with them and talk, teach them that court terminology that they're afraid to ask about. And so um, I, what I've witnessed as well is that our, our families that we're serving are afraid to even report good things. They're so terrified, they don't even know which is what they should or shouldn't say. And, and that, that should tell us that we have a system that is destructive and not a system that's encouraging. If we have families who are afraid to speak anything and then that have that be interpreted as uncooperative. So the language has to be completely overhauled. Sandy, um, I just want to uh, um, piggyback off of what you talked about here in Washington, D.C. We have a unit of what we call peers, family peers. And uh, those are parents who have had their kids removed through the child welfare system, but successfully you reunified. And so what we have seen a lot of great um, progress in is that they help to um, work with other parents, navigate what is a complex system when they go mm -hmm. to court, when they have to have a family team meeting, the visits, all of the things that would make any of us, you know, you know, run us crazy. Um, so I know that we've seen a lot of progress having people who relate, people who have experienced the system themselves. Um, and Louis, to your question in terms of how we failed. The system has failed because I think we have archaic child abuse and neglect statutes and laws. Mm -hmm. um, when, for instance, a child um, may have missed a couple of days of school, and it could be that they're visiting a relative. Well, here in Washington, D.C., if you're in Ward 7 and 8, where most of our kids are removed, more, more of our families of color reside versus Ward 2 and 3, where there's a different classism and socioeconomic status, um, the response from Ward 7 and 8 that you had a parent um, have their kid visit a relative is not an acceptable excuse because they may have seen a pattern of that just from generational cycles versus another family, which means that the policies are not applied equitably across the board. So I think our laws speak to if a child doesn't show up for school or um, if, if a parent lacks resources, those are things that if we level the playing field in our systems, that we can provide equitable support, we'll have a lot of families that the community can work with to support them to where they don't have to come deeply involved with the formal system. So I think we really need to take a look at mandated reporting laws and our child abuse and neglect statutes to really help shift what would be considered coming to the attention of a child welfare agency. I really appreciate what both Robert and Sandy are speaking to, because I think that oftentimes when we talk about child welfare, we speak about the family in this very, that's the labels, it's the words that we use. So when they come into our attention, we absolutely have this guise as if they've done something wrong, thus they're wrong. And we already have these perceptions that societally that we have about certain demographics of people about their wrongness. So then you come into these systems where it's basically something that's even more validated um, by policy, by practice. But I want to take a second, I want to step back because I want to speak for young people who are raised in this system that is historically racist. 
because I don't think we've often sat and thought about the detrimental impact of their development being in a system that doesn't value their culture, that doesn't look at the ways that their identity influences their walk, that doesn't not only think about the ways that we can explicitly uplift their skin, their culture, but also be honest about the ways that the society treats that skin in that culture. So we basically have a, a group of a, a large group of youth of color, youth of color who this system wasn't originally created for, now residing long term within a system that wasn't built for them. And then we get shocked when we see the statistics that showcase that, you know, our black and our brown youth are crossing over into juvenile justice at astronomical rates, that our black youth have for a number of years been overrepresented in the most restrictive placements as well as out of state placements, um, dependent on the states. So we, we have these statistics that showcase more, foster care is hard for everybody. And I, I wanna be clear about that as an advocate, it's not easy for anybody, the families, the kids, anybody. But then when we look at the demographics within foster care and we look at the ways that criminality is very much attached to young people in dependency and that criminality is very much race-based, then we really have to question the ways in which not just are we treating our families, but the ways that this system is raising kids and what happens once they leave it, if they survive it. Um, so for me, one of the biggest failings, and I'm speaking as a former child welfare worker, currently working for a nonprofit, but also somebody who experienced the foster care system and aged out of it, there was no part of it that felt affirmative to my identity. In fact, it taught me a lot about what society thinks about Black people. It's yeah. taken years for me to unlearn what I was taught and to also try to heal what those lessons did to me. And the thing about it is I've been able to do that, but now I work with a lot of young people who are currently getting those lessons about their invalue, uh, their disvalue, unva how unvalued they are about the fact that, okay, you're lazy. Like uh, talking to kids, using these words, this language that Sandy said, you're lazy or you ha you're attitudinal, <sighs> you're aggressive. And again, these are all sound like words, regular, but longstanding history, very coded, very detrimental, very pointed, and very targeting. And also, once you get those tags on your case files, that young people know it, they follow you for a very long time. So I'm very interested. It's, I think it's very important that we look at the ways in which if we continue to take kids out of their homes, which I agree with you, all the panelists have stated really clearly, we need to reinvest in families. We have to reinvest in communities. But as long as we have the out-of-home system, we need to be very intentional and very accepting of the fact that none of these placements are explicitly built for the children that they're currently serving and that they all have to be overhauled. And yes, that absolutely means restructuring the ways that we place our young people, prioritizing families, whether it's their biological family, a substitute family until we can get them back into their communities, but absolutely looking at the way that we utilize congregate care restrictive placements, as well as juvenile justice systems to warehouse our children of color. I just want us to, we have to sit with the power and what Sade is sharing. There's so much power in her, in, in those words, in, in the, her story. And, um, you know, I, we have to sit in that space. Um, it's, it, it makes me want to emphasize, we have to think about what it means that the system has conducted itself in such a way that that youth, that families routinely describe its intervention, not as helpful, but as decimation, right? When families say that child welfare is family, family regulation, it is family regulation. When, when youth and families say child welfare is family policing, it is family policing. Sit with that. We have to sit with that. Lean into it. Lean into the discomfort that that might bring up. Uh, and when we think our intention is to help, uh, even when we think the intention is to help, we have to understand the difference between intention and impact. And as Sade said, be will we need to be willing to unlearn. We need to be willing to re-educate, to reconceptualize what we view as help what we think is impossible or possible, what we conceptualize as broken, and really tune into this fact, like does fixing foster care, a system of, 
of remo removing or separating families? Does fixing that to work perfectly achieve racial equity and family well-being? It does not. It's the wrong intervention. It's the wrong goal. And instead, we should just relentlessly pour ourselves into building and generating conditions in society and relationships in society that make the need for foster care obsolete. Can I just real quick, because at Rako, Dr. Boyd, she just touched on something very imperative because originally she spoke on structural racism, how there these are ingrained parts of systems, institutions, and practices and policies everywhere. This is normalized part. It's not even something considered negative. This is literally the way of walking. Like she said, it's breathing. But I, I love what you also just inputted because it's also people. People create the policies. People create the regulations. Those institutions are continued by people. The structures in itself are sustained, implemented by people. So when we're talking about this disruption, we're talking about how we shift and change, one of the hard parts about this conversation is that oftentimes we speak about it as if it doesn't actually require personal reflection and change. It's systems change. But in reality, we're systems. So I love, I really appreciate Dr. Boyd's words because I think that it requires us all to look at the ways that implicit bias has influenced those moments of discretion for us, whether we're in the field doing the direct services or we're at, at the White House or we're in the Capitol. I mean, not the Capitol, I'm in Sacramento, I'm sorry. But y'all are in DC, like, you know, on the Hill. So I think that just making sure that we're remembering and constantly conscious that we all have power, <laughs> that we all have a part in this, either the sustenance of structural racism or the elimination of it. So thank you so much, because what you just said really touched me, Dr. Boyd. Let me say this, Sade and um, Dr. Boyd and Sandy. Um, being the one on the panel that is currently running the system, I just want you to know that your words are not going to fall on deaf ears. Um, what I will tell you, and this is the reality, is that um, we currently have a system that's been built that's much older than any of us, and the work it's going to take to reimagine it and shift it, um, it's going to take some time. But I, what I want you to know is that I'm encouraged by hearing what you just said. It's, it's motivating me to continuing the push um, that I started since I've been in this role. First, it starts with having a discussion because the discussion hadn't been at the table. And it is about the leadership that's going to be needed. Dr. Boyd reminded me of that the other day. Um, it's, it's taking that stand to know that we've been seeing this for years. This is nothing new. Yeah, It's nothing new. The data has been there. Uh, what it does require us is to go from having a discussion into action. And so where DC may not be the leader, it's underway. The discussion is at the table. We're having young people, we're talking about their experience because it is about their experience and it hadn't been the most positive experience. So I don't wanna stand here to say like, oh, child welfare is great. Um, it's not great. It's not a great experience for people. And it's definitely not a great experience for people of color, um, for a system that's been designed to oppress them. So um, it is encouraging to hear this. Um, I'm encouraged to take this, to learn from it and to make sure we go from words to action here in Washington, DC and again, won't happen overnight, um, but I think gradually, little by little, I think with people like you at the forefront helping to push the issue and push us, the ones running the, the systems, um, I think we're, we're headed in the right direction. One of the things that I think about, I'm glad that you brought up, Sade, the um, implicit bias, the unconscious bias. We don't even offer that as a weekly, monthly support to social workers because it, that's a human thing that happens. Everyone has it. And if there, um, we have you know, white social workers working with children of color who didn't, don't know what's normal in our communities. And I'm not, and, and for some reason what happens and, and what I have witnessed is people think like that the Indian Child Welfare Act protects abusive acts to children and it's like no we do not we we promote family preservation through healing but um this uh, the unconscious bias is what's most harmful i believe and then whatever policies that are not um designed for family preservation social worker also locked within that policy and we don't also offer 
um, within the institutions, any uh, regular um, de de-escalating anything that happened within them, um, the vicarious trauma that they can can experience. There's nothing there either. We set everybody up. That system sets everybody up. And I want to also add that when we place children in foster homes, we often, uh, from what I've heard from um, those that have gone into foster care, um, things that they report that happen to them are often not believed. Thank you for sharing. And we have those that have gone through uh, the foster care system and those who have been adopted uh, are the experts of what the outcomes of these policies and um, that have. I mean, it's just, we are not disgruntled. We are not skewed. We know what this experience feels like. And we know that it leads to su um, suicide, higher rate of suicide among those who have experienced foster care and adoption, higher rates of abuse. Uh, and we need to look at, I would encourage communities that are listening, how do you pull together those experts with the lived experience to help you address and reframe and restructure what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. You know, as somebody who works in the child welfare space, I know what all of you are saying is true. But as somebody who grew up in it, I feel what you're saying is true as well. And I think it takes a level of intentionality uh, and uh, just giving a piece of yourself to have these true, truly important and necessary conversations. We thank you so much for being a part of the session. Uh, we value really having people from all over the system, the, the teachers for it, the, the teachers of our next generation of youth, the, the directors, our elders, you know, and we really want to be able to continue to, uh, to inspire you to have these conversations amongst yourself, amongst your colleagues, amongst your friends, knowing that it's not always going to be easy, but that these were matter. Thank you all so much for the amazing, authentic, and solution-oriented discussions that you contributed to today. That's all the time we have for now, but before we send you off, there's one more surprise in store that I'm really excited about. Our next piece has a particularly special meaning to me in a way that the speaker probably doesn't even know. Imagine you're 14 years old at your first conference still very much coming into your identity and you happen to attend the talent show for that night. And as soon as this girl steps on stage to recite her poem, the room starts to become mesmerized with her art, which is inspiring you to take pride in their blackness. And imagine that as a 14 year old kid, your first experience hearing about taking pride in your skin at a youth conference is a memory that still sticks with you nearly a decade later. You never know whose life you can change just by having these kinds of conversations, even if you don't know who's listening. Thank you, Sade. Sade Daniels is a highly sought out and gifted public speaker, award-winning spoken word artist, and at a young age has amassed over a decade of experience working within child welfare and reform efforts. Beginning at age 16, Sade has been part of groundbreaking research on group homes, instrument, been instrumental in widespread curriculum development for child welfare professionals, and uh, is a dedicated practitioner serving marginalized transitional age youth within the foster care system. Sade boldly analyzes and confronts the disproportionality of children of color in the foster care system and works collaboratively with stakeholders to address implicit biases and systemic racism throughout her state of California. Ladies, gentlemen, and friends across the non-binary spectrum, please welcome Sade Daniels. So I'm gonna do a poem for you all now. Uh, it's called Young, Gifted, and uh, play off of a very popular song by Nina Simone or Aretha, depending on your musical taste. But um, I wrote this uh, in response to a lot of the young people that I was working with at the time who were really struggling with valuing a huge part of their identity because of the systems that they were involved in um, that didn't really see a lot of value within said identity. 
or at the very least didn't really treat them um, as if they were valuable. I think that the young gifted is so inherent in all of the young people that we serve, but we can't forget the and because that's just as imperative. That's just as important. So I hope y'all enjoy. To be young, to be gifted, to be parentless, genetically blacklisted, when even as kids, the melanin skin is a risk. How much value do we extend to their adolescent development? As a whole, in this state, they're no more than 10%. How are black kids close to double that within the system? How exactly did we get here? And these ain't new stats explored. Historically, the black community has been an overrepped minority. Yet we're too weary to report on how disproportions distort realities and manifest itself into bias. But since no one wants to be perceived as racist, we pretend we all have the Midas. That we'll save every child the same, it, regardless of race, color, or ethnicity, failing to see that race is a large part of children's identities. It's a part of who they are, how they live, and most definitely how they'll be treated in this world. The children and families that we serve can't afford to exist colorblindly as we and our policies sometimes do. Black kids are the least likely to be reunified yet nationally last picked for adoptions, connections to culture stop, and for some reason, congregate care seems to be the most common and popular option for them, more than any other demographic. How was that possible? When did the crossover shift from shaking defenders to kids getting returned as senders from child welfare to juvenile justice back to child welfare until the cycle fails to cease and considering the harm done by law enforcement on black communities, why are we still calling the police on them? Intentionality is moot. The truth is these kids and families not failing those cracks, we push them through it. They were appalled and confused when their actions match what we ensued. When the way they see the world matches the way the world treats them and in consequence, we cut the roots right from beneath them. They get no innocence, nor are they extended the benefit of a doubt. Even during a pandemic, systems see their skin before they even open their mouths. We are complicit in creating this reality. Then we punish them for living it out. I remember seeing nothing but black faces in almost all of my group home placements. See, we had isolating behaviors that required more extensive surveillance. Our young mistakes would always be exclusively tied to our faith. Perpetually reated from the staff, workers, cops, reporters, and TV stations that we slick ain't meant to make it. So this young skin became a hindrance, thus I learned to hate it. This was clearest to me while I was in dependency. Foster care ain't really child friendly for anybody just yet. We working on it. But it's historically scaled levels of detriment for African Americans. Until the black girls. Edges slick but edged to the back. Now, is it still black girl magic when we laid out in caskets or trafficked across the atlas in the community barely gassed? So I have to ask, do you actually see us all as human or are we still fractions? Three fifths, right. And all the love to those sitting in the margins with intersecting identities as we struggle to see all of who they are. We see our LGBTQ plus kin being discarded the hardest. We stand in for you regardless. Affirming all the kinds of black lives is the target with this. And that's the beauty of these hues. While often misconstrued comes the ancestral, while often misconstrued, even with bruises, comes the ancestral ability to self-soothe and continue to move. Our black kids magnificent and oh how it feels to be young black and gifted ruptured lineage but still part of the kindred look how many mouths we forced when only given inches so it's gonna take all of us here in the trenches so on today all i ask is that you listen with the open mind and hearts and don't shy away from the tension because it's supposed to be there self-assessment is required for change
Today and beyond, our intentions must match our actions. We're looking at our praxis and reflecting on anti-Blackness, the ways that we've all channeled it and how we will dismantle it. We're staying steadfast to our commitment to the collective safety and well-being of all children. But on today, I am explicitly talking about the Black ones because they are young and they are gifted. Afrocentric are cultures on America's wish list because they are young and they are gifted and not despite being Black, but because they are Black. Thank you. Today, we have had an opportunity to think about the future of how we approach this work, the moves we make, and all of the past that we can learn from. In his sermon following Selma's Bloody Sunday in 1965, one of the most violent days in American history, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. proclaimed that a man dies when he refuses to stand up for that which is right. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for justice. A man dies when he refuses to take a stand for that which is true. We know that the numbers of disproportionality for Black and Native American youth don't lie. We also know that there are vast disparities for our youth of color throughout foster care just by listening to the countless stories that highlight our experiences. Over the day, we will be hosting a series of plenaries and planning for action sessions that will continue to inform cutting edge practices, advice, and strategies for implementing racial equity work throughout child welfare from the experts themselves. In order to make a change, we must shift the way that we think and continue to take steps to inform ourselves in history, language, data, training, and policy. And well, you're off to a great start if you made it to Sweevee. Lastly, feel free to pop over to our self-care gallery to check out some podcasts, articles, and website links. And remember to take care of yourself. Thank you speakers. Thank you to all who came. And remember that knowledge is power. Stay safe and be well.